this is Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline, and I'm your host, Monica Hadley, and with me is my co-host and mother, Caroline Kilborn. And good afternoon, everyone. So what do we have in store for our guest today, Mom? Oh, gosh. We have a <laughs> really interesting, interesting uh, author. Is uh, <clears throat> Kenneth Woodward, Woodward. Is that how you pronounce it? Okay. And uh, he edited Newsweek's religion section from 1964 until his retirement in 2002. It's a long haul there. <laughs> he remained a contributing editor at Newsweek until 2009. Although he has written more than a 1,000 essays, articles, and reviews for a variety of magazines, newspapers, and scholarly publications, he is an author of Making Saints, How the Catholic Church Determines Who Becomes a Saint, Who Doesn't, and Why, and The Book of Miracles, The Meaning of the Miracle Stories in Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism, and Islam. He's a native of Cleveland, Ohio, and a graduate of Notre Dame. He lives in Chicago, Illinois, for more information. And the author of his current, or the title of his current book is Getting Religion, Faith, Culture, and Politics from the Age of Eisenhower to the Era of Obama. Welcome to Writer's Voices, Ken. My pleasure. <laughs> it's our pleasure to have you here. How did you become a religion journalist in the first place? Was that something you set out to do? More people ask me that, more <laughs> often in New York than out in Iowa, I can tell you that. Um, uh, I walked in off the street. <laughs> really? Oh my gosh. That's simple. I walked in off the street and, uh, uh, and, and um, I was working in Omaha and I thought it was time to go to New York. I went to Time and I went to Newsweek and they both offered me jobs, believe it or not. And I was only on a weekly there. And then uh, the religion job was the one at uh, at Newsweek. I think I'm the only reason uh, the only person that's ever been hired um, because he was Catholic rather than despite it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And why was that? Why did they want somebody who was Catholic? Oh, because it was way. Vatican Council too was coming to an end, and oh yeah, more people and more knowledgeable people over in Rome uh, in the bureau there. And they didn't have anybody who really knew much about this. And uh, they saw that I was Catholic and that I went to Notre Dame, which means I probably should know something about my Catholicism. So I, to be honest, they never said this, but I think that I, well, I know it was, a, it was a major factor. So, um, yes, that's how I got hired. And uh, the uh, title of the, my book uh, has a couple of meanings, and one of them is um, my getting, that is saying, learning to understand uh, mm -hmm. religion, and, mm -hmm. and not not just my own, but everybody else's. So that uh, you mentioned my book on the, on, um, the miracles, um, that's a very serious study okay. of how the function, uh, uh, miracles function in different world religions. So it's been my trying to get it all the way along. Um, and the other... Uh, meaning to the title is um, Americans well let me tell you a simple story uh, periodically the women's magazines especially uh, back in the 60s, 70s and 80s would all of a sudden discover that, that, that uh, there are a lot of people in America who are religious and they would keep uh, they would forget that and they'd come back to it again so <laughs> there was that sense of, of they were learning how to get it what was going on with their own readers and then finally, there, uh, there really was uh, an explosion of, of, of uh, religious energy uh, in the second half of the 20th century, and I compare it, and I've talked to historians about this, um, compare it to the middle of the 19th century and the Second Great Awakening, which gave us Mormonism, which gave us uh, uh, the LDS Church, it gave us uh, Disciples of Christ, uh, there were the, the revival movements of all kinds, so uh, people don't think of it that way because most of the people who think about American religion at all are Christian, few are Jewish, uh, and they uh, think of, of uh, indica indications of institutional decline, uh, especially from the, the 50s, which is the most religious decade in the history of America. Uh, so I, my plot line is... Decline plus explosion. Uh, it's a double helix, uh, and uh, both things were happening at once. 
And since I was in the middle of it, and since my grandchildren will not know it unless I tell them the story, <laughs> right? children who were growing up and it didn't realize it was going on, I wrote the book. Well, and in Getting Religion, you're, it's part, part memoir and part kind of, um, what to say, uh, an analysis of what was going on in, in American religion during and, your lifetime. And, his, uh, and, I, and historical. Y- you're right. It, you know, I found that if you want to engage the reader, especially the young reader, um, in ancient history, which it is to young people, <laughs> yeah, you have to right. tell them stories. And yeah. so I used uh, autobiography to illustrate in a most vivid fashion um, what it was like growing up, and I'd like to read something from you on that, growing up in the uh, 40s and 50s, uh, because I compare it to growing up today, and I think growing up today is infinitely harder. Every grandparent will tell you that. And, uh, mm-hmm. and I use uh, memoir because I'm... Uh, in a strict sense, uh, in the sense of not talking about how my parents beat me up. Actually, they didn't. <laughs> Remember, <laughs> uh, people like that. Billy Graham, the Dalai Lama, people that I got to know very, very well. So, um, so that people can relive my experiences with them, and uh, mm. and, and in a sense, go back with me. So that's what I'm trying to do. What, well, did, what did you study in college, Ken? I studied, the only thing worth studying for somebody like me, I studied, I studied literature and, uh, at Notre Dame, and then uh, after a stint at Michigan Law School, and long enough to discover I didn't like that, especially what they do to the language, <laughs> up to Iowa, um, Iowa City. Uh, so uh, studied at the time that Paul Engel was at the Writers' Workshop. Oh. Uh, I was up on what they call up on the hill, doing more academic work, and um, and what what year were you in at Iowa? Uh, my God, before God got up in the morning, <laughs> let's see. Um, it had to be. I graduated Notre Dame in fifty seven. Okay. So fifty eight, fifty nine, fifty nine. To 60, I guess it was. Yeah. Okay, so you didn't overlap with Caroline because she was there earlier than that. Yeah, I was there earlier. <laughs> well, she might have been there. Well, Paul Engel was teaching poetry then. Uh, I think Vance Bergeli was there. Uh, I have great stories. I, I, I'm not going to take up the time here to tell them, but fond memories of the place and funny stories. Uh, you know, young ladies would come off the farms and graduate from college and you know go over to write, and they would... Uh, Suddenly, they would discover, say, Eugene O'Neill, and they would, all of a sudden, they're dressed in black, <laughs> and the coloration of, uh, of what of what they were learning. Um, so it was uh, it was a lot of fun. But my wife grew up in Esterville, oh. and uh, spent most of her life in Des Moines. So instead of going to Northwestern to study uh, with Richard Elman under. Uh, uh, on James Joyce, I went to Iowa because that's where my intended was. Oh, well. <laughs> well, you picked a good place. Um, I enjoyed <laughs> it a lot. I really did. And uh, But anyhow, um, there is something, I mean, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll hear it in the, in the way I'm writing here. I want to read something to you, which is, we'll give you an example of how I used my own growing up, to talk about an era now long gone, and you'll catch the comparison very early on uh, with uh, what I'm getting at here. So this is called Growing Up on the Home Front, comes from the first chapter. I was born in 1935 and passed through childhood while the nation was at war. Unlike the war in Vietnam two decades later, World War II united the nation in common cause. Unlike our more recent wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, this war was fought was not fought off stage by volunteers so that the good life at home could continue uninterrupted. To the contrary, on the home front, all children were suckled in a culture of sacrifice and restraint, one that linked us closer to the children of the Great Depression, though our circumstances were never so drastic, than to our own children born into post-war affluence. Beginning in 1942, um, 
staples of the good life, first sugar, then gasoline, fuel oil, and rubber tires, then fruit juices, canned and frozen food, including baby food, even shoes and clothes, were strictly rationed. As participants in the common war effort, everyone may do. My mother dutifully planted a low-yield victory garden, thin carrots, limp bean stalks, <laughs> lettuce the size of baseballs. By war's end, 40% of the nation's vegetables were harvested from an estimated 20 million family plots like ours. At the store, Mother bought meat and butter with red ration stamps from her government-issued war ration book and soups and dried beans from stamps colored blue. Because he was a salesman and his car was his living, uh, my father got extra ration stamps for gas. At home, he did his civil duty as a suburban air raid warden. One night a month, when the warning siren sounded, he put on a yellow metal uh, put a yellow metal helmet on his head and went about making sure the neighbors had turned out all their lights, lest enemy bombers should penetrate the airspace over Lake Erie's southern shore. My older brother and I followed the battles overseas by pasting newspaper headlines in scrapbooks. From inside cereal boxes, we collected colorful arm patches worn by the men in uniform, and from strips of balsam wood and glue, built models of the airplanes uh, the American pilots flew. It was a good time to be a child. So, mm. there's a lot going on in there, as you can see. One is the comparison with today, where the kids don't even know where Afghanistan and Iraq are, uh, where there's no draft and there's therefore no, vul no vulnerability and no interest. And, and no rationing and no sacrifice. No, no sacrifice no. whatsoever. No. So, um, yeah, I thought about that. Now, of course, I wouldn't compare it to what the kids in the Depression went through. Uh, but uh, but uh, that's a different, uh, that's one of the big differences that, uh, from, from that era, you know, to, uh, to our own. And um, so we're hiding from things, even though... Uh, every time you turn around, there's the Internet and there's television and the rest of it to let you know what's going on. We're, we're bystanders, um, mm -hmm. observers at best. And uh, young people in colleges today, they can't even tell you where those places are either, by and large. I had a laugh when uh, there was a lot of talk about uh, winning the youth vote. And the thing is, young people don't vote, and they haven't for a long time, only in small percentages. So, uh, yeah, we have, uh, it, it's an argument I make at the end of the book. We have a disengaged uh, group of young people. It's not their fault. It's what they were born into. Um, and uh, so that they postpone adulthood to age 30, and um, they're kind of on the shelf. I'm here in Chicago, and all the bars are around here. And it's, it's uh, they're not plunged into adulthood until uh, until much later, and that has... That has consequences. Yeah, I, I hadn't really thought about that. I hadn't either, but you're right. Well, I wrote a book. The first book I wrote was The Grandparent-Grandchild Relationship, so I've tried to pay a lot of attention to connections like that. So we're a long way from religion, aren't we? Yeah, we are. We are. Um, so let me tell you why. If you look at the... Uh, the reader looks at the... Um, at the... Uh, uh, chapter headings, the word Protestant, Catholic, Jew do not appear at all. Uh, what appear are phrases like embedded religion, movement religion, uh, entrepreneurial religion. Uh, these are categories that I invented, and I hope they work, I think, <laughs> to connect what's going on socially, culturally, and politically with what is going on in religion. So what would you say is like the biggest change in America in terms of religion from your childhood to today? Well, there are several, but there's... Um, I mean, I know that's what the whole book is kind of addressing. But <laughs> uh, it, it is, but also uh, um, it isn't... 
it's more descriptive than anything, and to, to know what went on, really. Um, one of the changes is that when I, oh, the, the era that I am talking about, now what I wrote to you was about uh, the, the late 40s, okay? The book really is second half of the 20th century, because I, I actually came of age during the 50s. Um, one of the differences was uh, that the culture, um, the post-war culture in which we were fighting an atheist enemy, right? Mm -hmm. Atheist communism, it was never just communism, but atheist communism. Um, the, the, the culture as a whole supported religious belief, behavior, and belonging. Um, it, as I said before, it was the most religious decade in the American history, history, and therefore it's an anomaly. Um, people usually aren't that religious. Uh, as I say in the book, we built more churches and synagogues and houses of worship uh, in, the, in the 50s uh, than we have before, ever did before or since. Mm. And people went to them. They filled them. If you were polled, they said 98% say they believed in God. Um, the, the, uh, by, the, by 1960, uh, half the Catholic school-aged children were in Catholic schools. Mm. And um, the Protestant seminaries uh, <laughs> were turning men away, and the, the kind of folks that were accepted were the ones that uh, typically, you know, would have become doctors or lawyers or, uh, you know, let's say corporate captains of industry. Not so today. So um, that couldn't be sustained, but it is the environment that I grew up in. And one of the things I talk about is what religion you were. Um, was uh, uh, that, that, that religion was really what made the culture diverse. Um, and so those are the kinds of, I don't want to get into all these details, but that's very different from today. Uh, we think of diversity today as either, well, start out being either male or female, which is not very diverse. If you only got two kinds, <laughs> we've sliced the onion thinner since then. Yeah. <laughs> these religion, like in Iowa, uh, or let's say in Wisconsin, um, whether you're either Lutheran or Catholic. And, of course, down south there were more Baptists than there were people. Um, <laughs> environment. Um, a lot. And uh, uh, that's what I talk about in that. Uh, and what, what, your parent, what religion your parents were was almost always going to be what religion you were. Well, that's still pretty much true today. Now, that's what I call embedded religion, okay? So in there I talk about, in that book I talk about growing up Catholic, and I say, to be Catholic is to, was to, uh, a child, uh, a Catholic in those days, was to imagine yourself at uh, the center of uh, concentric circles of belonging. Um, it was uh, all the Catholics in your parish. It was all the Catholics in the other parishes that you was met when you uh, went to Mass elsewhere, usually in traveling. It was all the Catholics that ever were, were ever likely to be. <laughs> and then there were those um, saints um, looking down on us uh, like grandparents from high front porches. <laughs> That's the view of a child, uh, that sense of belonging. Mm. And I think, uh, I know from people who have told me because they've read the book, you can analogize, to, you don't have to be Catholic to be that way, um, who felt comfortable uh, in the environment they were in and in neighborhoods um, and in local institutions, very much the church, uh, but others. And uh, so uh, 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 that's, uh, that's, that's what I'm talking about. And uh, most of that is gone, too. Um, neighborhoods, I don't, can't speak for Fairfield, Iowa, but... Um, Neighborhoods don't exist like they do because there's nobody home. Mm. Nobody home to uh, call out from the front porch or front door and say, Jamie, your mother wouldn't like you doing this. Or, <laughs> Charlie, I got hot donuts, come on in. Both people are working. We're yeah. in a different, we're in a work society now, yeah. so it's very different. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I grew up 
came of age in the 60s and 70s, and, and a lot of people my age questioned the, you know, the institutional authorities and questioned the, the religions from a very young age. I mean, I, I talked to well, friends I, about that a true. lot. that's true, and I, um, uh, I certainly deal, uh, I deal with that. What happened in, in your generation, which you identify with, is that your numbers were so great you simply overwhelmed every institution <laughs> into. Um, I can't stress that enough as a as a uh, necessary condition for understanding sixties mm. and uh, questioning institutions. Okay, um, and it uh, it. Uh, uh, and on what basis did they question them, since they didn't know much coming in, right? Right. Um, uh, it's a little hard to understand that, but it was their numbers. And, of course, there was the war. Mm. Who wants to go to um, a war in Vietnam? Um, that's why the anti-war stuff pretty well stopped when, when, the, when the draft was uh, rescinded. Right. Just there wasn't real and genuine opposition. But there was opposition to almost anything, you know. Um, uh, anything institutional was bad because the individual was good. Well, that's that's what that's the kind of thing that kids think. Yeah, and we're kind of hearing that again today. Oh, you are to some extent. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, uh, my perspective is a little different. Um, they, uh, they, um, the demand to make. Uh, Growing up today is like what Norman Mailer called uh, creating advertisements for myself. Um, think of what kids have to do. And mm. uh, they are told at an early age they got to get good grades. And mm-hmm. uh, if they want to, because they got to go to college, and in some cases, got to go to a really good, if you're going to make something of yourself. Well, from a strictly religious point of view, we don't make something of ourselves. Um, that's something of a typical American myth, um, and it really does suggest that everything resides in ourselves, and so um, uh, you can't very well be religious uh, if you're preoccupied with yourself. Now, there are some styles of Christianity that uh, cater to that. I mean, you've seen Joel Osteen on television and so forth. Um there's a lot of that ridiculous stuff, but the the whole prosperity gospel thing. Yeah, that's yeah. all about themselves, yeah, um, yeah. and mm-hmm. so that does cater to that. Yeah, to that effort. Um, but uh, one of the problems I worry about is the alienation of institutions. What are the institutions? Well, um, no, let's let me put it this way: There's been a lot of talk lately about young people, the millennials, not being as religious as previous generations, and uh, I talk a lot about this in the book and why. But, uh, and, and, and you put your finger on it, um, in that uh, they're, they're, they're alienated from all institutional anything. Mm-hmm. Um, they're not brought, uh, they're brought up by a new so- uh, following a new social script. Um, I am able to recreate my, the, uh, uh, as I do in the book, the whole thick sense of growing up. Um, and the social arrangements and the institutions. Is families an institution? Schools are institutions. Um, you know, they you know like a like a like the character from a good book. You know, you uh, they they abide in me still as I abide in them. Mm. Um, and that's a great sense of belonging and having uh, not just a naked self but an embedded self. So. Religion, in, uh, in back in those days, I call embedded religion. And geogra- geography played a role, ethnicity played a role, always does in religion. So where you lived, uh, what your ethnicity was, uh, uh, it was also determined in some ways what kind of religion you got. So you got it from the locals. Um, the other kinds of religion, the one that comes into play uh, in the, uh, well, it begins in the 50s, uh, is... Uh, movement religion, and uh, that's a fairly, uh, rather rich chapter. I mean, we Oh, yeah, let's talk a little bit more about that, but first I want to 
make sure that our listeners know who we're talking to. Yes, <laughs> You're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today is Kenneth Woodward, former religion editor of Newsweek for almost 40 years and author of Getting Religion, Faith, Culture, and Politics from the Age of Eisenhower to the Era of Obama. So how do you define movement religion? Well, I mean, it, it's so much more than noticing it than um, what, what an embedded religion, where you come from matters, um, what your you know family was and religious background was, where you lived, all that sort of thing. Movement religion is just the opposite. Um, and it really begins with Martin Luther King, and uh, which is in you know the middle of the fifties. By the way, it's not a sixties phenomenon, and he did in the middle of the sixties. Anyhow, that's and did you did you know him? Where, where you come from, I'm, uh, and uh, what your ethnicity doesn't matter. You could be a, a Unitarian from Massachusetts. You could be a, um, a Lutheran from Wisconsin. Uh, Methodist from uh, Clinton, Iowa. Um, it didn't matter. Um, it ma- what mattered is the brother and sisterhood of the movement. You didn't have to be religious at all, as a matter of fact. And a lot of people in the movement weren't. What matters is the movement. And the movement is a sense of, of uh, we're moving with history. History's on our side. Um, that's what you identify with, and that's where your attachment is. So in the book, I look at various movements. Um, I spent time in Latin America, uh, where Americans, North Americans were very much involved. Liberation theology uh, is a variation. Women, uh, the women's movement and religion is uh, something rather different because the founders weren't religious at all and didn't think about it in, in, uh, at all. Um, and I knew Betty Friedan, and I knew... Uh, Gloria Steinem, um, and I'm much less impressed with them than a lot of people are, you know, as thinkers and so forth. Um, so you had you had those movements, but let me give you another example, which is uh, happens in the '80s, and, and this chapter is called "Sacred Families." Now, beginning with the Moynihan Report, Daniel Patrick Moynihan. He, you guys must remember that, mm-hmm. where he talked about uh, uh, what was happening in the black to the black family, the African American family, and uh, twenty years later, the same statistics applied to white families. Only because they were white instead of black, uh, we engaged as a culture in what he called de- uh, defining deviancy down. Uh, in another of his famous essays. So the background is the decline of marriage in the family to the point where now marriage is, is a li- marriage is essentially a lifestyle option. Marriage is also an institution, so it's an institution that's that's um, really been cracked and broken, uh, and therefore the family divorce rate, all of that. You know that's those statistics. In any case, in the in the eighties, uh, a million kids a year ran away from home. As I say in the book, these were not Huck Finns uh, hailing out, you know, down the Mississippi for adventure. Uh, nor were they poor kids. They're large. They were college freshmen, sometimes sophomores, high school seniors, usually middle class and up families, mostly white, and uh, and a lot of them um, um, victims, let's say, of what had been happening to marriage in the family. Um, at the same time, we saw the emergence of no, more than 300 new religious movements. They were called cults then in those days, mm-hmm. which is a pejorative. Uh, and, uh, and, but so you look at the nature of these cults, if you will, and I described several of them, but a lot of, spent a lot of time on the Unification Church of Dr. Moon, Moon which is huge at the time. Um, they usually had... Uh, it took the form of sacred families with the mother and father. Dr. Moon was uh, the father, and his wife was the uh, uh, the mother. And, and I could go through a lot of them. There were Bowen Peep, one of those cults that ended up uh, uh, committing mass suicide. But 300 of them. So the connection between the rise of the cults, which people 
don't know about anymore because they did disappear is connected, in this case, to changes in society and structures and the collapse of an institution. So that's how I treat religion. It's always, um, it's always involved in, um, in what is going on. It isn't, it isn't something separate. Um, so that's an example wow. of what I mean by treating religion, culture, and politics together. Now, you met a lot of the um, kind of religious figures of this time period in your work with Newsweek, right? I did. I did. And do you, you know, were there some that you, you know, felt their kind of godliness, or did they all just seem pretty human to you? Well, they didn't seem particularly god. Well, they were godly. I mean, there were some people who understood that they were living in the presence of God, and others who didn't. Let me. Um, I've been talking a lot here. Let me tell you. Got something in here about Billy Graham, um, whom I knew very well, um, and I did a cover story on Billy during during the the Nixon period, and went out. Uh, and there's a long section on him which which uh, you know i remember him as a child i remember you know i grew up catholic also so we weren't necessarily um fans of billy graham but i i always was annoyed when his big meetings preempted my favorite tv shows (laughs) (laughs) yeah well so anyhow what's happening here is this was at the height of his connection with billy graham his height of his, I mean, with uh, Nixon and, and, and with his uh, also the um, the uh, war, the anti-war protests and so forth. Um, so uh, I uh, let me see if I can find this here. Uh, so anyhow, I'm I'm going to do a cover story on Billy, and um, I treat him a little differently. I treat him as a, a preacher of the American civil religion as it existed at that time. We don't need to go into that concept here, though. Um, I just lost the page. And um, so I'm out there, and and uh, and uh, I meet Billy, and uh, and uh, I notice that he's all all the guys on his team, you know, the, the organist, the, the singer, they're all, they're all wearing green. They all they're like uh, Southern football coaches. They have everybody uh, on the coaching team has the same colors on well they had the same even the car ranch their coats and uh i'd gone out on a sunday on the red eye and thinking well when i get to mass today and uh seemed a little hard the way the day was laid out for me and so forth um but uh, i also learned talking to billy he didn't he didn't much go to church either. He never <laughs> went to church, or very rarely, when he was out, uh, you know, doing crusades, which was more more than half of, the, of his time. So, uh, anyhow, that's a little background. So, we get to his uh, old radio studio. He's uh, he's t- editing or uh, looking at a, a tape of a crusade he gave, at which Nixon appeared in uh, ten, in. Uh, in Knoxville, Tennessee, um, and it was a very important crusade because Nixon was there, and he was really uh, Nixon at that time was not a welcome on college campuses, and uh, Billy made it possible for him to be on a college campus holding a crusade and on one, and then inviting. Um, mm. Anyhow, okay. So oh, um, here's what it, I write. Uh, whatever else they may be, evangelists are genuine American performance artists. And in watching Graham on videotape, I was witnessing one of the best. I also, we're in his studio now, I also watched Billy watching himself. What are you experiencing, I asked. I expected an analysis of his technique, perhaps some second guessing of his doppelganger on the monitor, but that is not what I got. Quote, I get so engrossed, Ken, I don't, think of myself, uh, I don't think of the man on television as me. I think of him as another person speaking because the Spirit of God begins to speak to me through him. At that moment, I began to understand what makes evangelical preaching more than just a hortatory exercise. 
Through his voice, Graham was exercising a priestly function. It wasn't just the Bible preached as the word of God that mattered. It was the orchestrated collective experience, the speaking and the hearing and the singing that made Christ present to the crowd. I was witnessing a verbal sacrament, though Graham would never use such terms, in which Christ the Word made flesh became Christ the flesh made words. Just by listening to himself on videotape that Sunday in Los Angeles, Billy Graham had made it to church after all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, there's a lot of theological stuff in those sentences for those who know their theology. And uh, I was trying to recapture for the reader, um, and especially the non-Baptist, non-evangelical reader, um, exactly what that preaching meant. You've heard, uh, I've heard Baptists say, uh, you know, if they haven't heard a good sermon, then they haven't been to church. Um, people in the sacramental churches, Catholics, or especially Orthodox uh, Christians, uh, the more high church Episcopalians, the Lutherans, it's a different, it's a different experience. Um, they have a different sense of presence. So there really is diversity in, in, uh, um, in Christianity. And You and know, one thing I found interesting, to explain what it means. when you're writing about Billy Graham, you, you said, uh, you quote him as saying that he felt most at home in the evangelical wing of the Anglican Church. Yeah, he did. <laughs> um, um, I'm glad you brought that up, but that's true. Um, there's a lot of things about Billy in there that, uh, that uh, people who think they know Graham... Uh, don't really, uh, but he did. Yeah, he. I think he, among other things, he's in his plain Baptist threads, you know, and he he mm-hmm. uh, liked to, sort of the contrast with all the the people in their robes. But um, the Baptist ritual, and it is a ritual. They wouldn't like to call it, but it is. Um, speaks to the ear and the mouth. Okay, it is singing and preaching and hearing the singing and hearing the preaching. Um, and, of course, the culmination of the ritual is the altar call. Yeah, with no altar. With um, no altar. And I, you know, I was actually talking about this with friends recently because I was at a um, kind of an activist meeting, and, and I recognized some elements of the altar call <laughs> in that. And, you know, as I said, I grew up Catholic, but I had a in a mostly Protestant community. And so I had a lot of Protestant friends and I went to some revival meetings with them as a child. And I was always uncomfortable with the kind of the emotional aspect of it. Um, how I felt like, like there was this deliberate attempt to play on my emotions. And even as a child that bothered me. Sure. And yet I still succumb to it. I I talk about it. There are different sensibilities. And I think if we don't understand what those sensibilities are and how they're different, we don't understand each other all that well. Um, Billy never quite understood the sacramental tradition of Catholics. He just never got it. And, um, uh, and it takes some time to work yourselves into this. Look, I wrote a book on world religions. I spent a year trying to figure out... His, uh, um, Hinduism, it's very difficult because it's so unlike anything we have over here. Anyhow, um, but just on these levels of, of, of sensibility, um, I'll give you an example. Uh, personal is not in the book. Um, the uh, religion editor at Time Magazine for several decades was evangelical by background, Calvinist, northern Michigan, and... Uh, he would talk about church. And what he meant by church was the local congregation. And when I talked about church, sitting in the back of my mind always was this huge complex uh, stretching around the world and finding an apex in Rome. And it's not that we didn't have congregations. They do. Um, But uh, uh, there's a lot of discussion in there. After Vatican Council II, I was over in Rome, and there was a lovely Methodist historian theologian wonderful man, who uh, was trying to help this young reporter along, and he says, he's from Texas, 
Ken, you got to understand something, Ken. <laughs> Down in their hearts, we Protestants distrust the structures we've created, meaning denominations, because mm-hmm. denominations were created in the United States. They were created in Europe. Mm. And he said, deep down, you have to understand, even for the most liberal Catholic, Holy Mother of the Church is, God damn it, Holy Mother of the Church. <laughs> and in his rough way, <laughs> was talking about two different sensibilities there. Mm. So a lot of that kind of stuff plays in and around the, the, the paragraphs and <laughs> of my book. You're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today is Kenneth Woodward, author of Getting Religion, Faith, Culture, and Politics from the Age of Eisenhower to the Era of Obama. Um, before we run out of time, Ken, I want to ta- ask you a little bit about your um, friendship with the Dalai Lama and how that came um, about. Dalai Lama and I are the same age, and uh, I used to needle him. I said, you and I are the same age, uh, minus a few million incar- reincarnations. <laughs> He would laugh that wonderful laugh, and uh, and he a uh, uh, very engaging guy. He's non-threatening. You know, everybody wants to be a Buddhist that isn't anything else, and uh, <laughs> they don't really understand Buddhism. But uh, uh, and I talk about that, and he talked about it. He didn't like what I call a designer Buddhism you get in America. Right? Mm. Uh, one of the things you learn from the book is that most Buddhists throughout history and even today don't meditate. And uh, even most monks don't meditate, and yet what Americans want out of Buddhism is meditation, calm the nerves, all that kind of stuff. Um, a lot of them are, kind of, are, 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 you know, are Jewish or Christian, they're trying to get away from heavens and hell. Well, Tibetan Buddhism's got six heavens and six hells. Um, how much of the other religion do you want to take? Okay. <laughs> Every religion that uh, ends up on the American shore gets transformed, I think, by the American experience. Um, yeah. It simply mm. goes with the, uh, with the territory. But there's one person in the book that uh, does not get criticized. <laughs> and that is? Well, his name is um, Abraham Joshua Heschel. Um, and you should read his books, a little book on the Sabbath and uh, so forth. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to read a little bit, very short about it. Um, I met him during the, uh, he was a leader of uh, the uh, clergy and layman concern about Vietnam, and he marched with King. He's a little short guy with the yarmulke and the white beard you see in all the pictures at Selma. And I wrote about Selma, but that's another story. Um, Anyhow, so I do a story on him, and he invites me to come back and... and, uh, and, um, and and talk to him. So I go up to Jewish Theological Seminary in the Upper West Side of New York, and here's what I find. Within the warren of faculty offices at Jewish Theological Seminary, Heschel's was the smallest, windowless like the restroom down the hall, and not nearly so roomy. Tilting mounds of books rose up like stalagmites from his desk and teetered precariously from the bowed shelves above his head, threatening at any moment to bury him under the text he loved so much. Although he never mentioned it to me, his cramped quarters were indicative of the rude treatment he experienced at the seminary. Here he is, the greatest rabbi of the 20th century, and this is what's happening to him. He was, now back here, he was not permitted to sit in the front row of the synagogue for service, only rarely asked to give a blessing over the Torah reading, and in his 27 years at the seminary, he was never asked to deliver a sermon, an honor even students were accorded. Why? Because his Hasidic theology and piety contradicted the post-Enlightenment Judaism of the seminary. Mm. Our conversations always began with a topic of my choosing, and his reply invariably uh, was uh, in the same Hasidic fashion. My friend, let me tell you a story. Well, I tell stories about Heschel. Now, here's the end of his life. According to Jewish... Let me see if we've got time. Yeah, I think we do. Oh, yeah. Uh, according to Jewish tradition, it is a blessing to die on the day God set aside for rest. For Heschel, the Sabbath was, quote, a foretaste of eternity, end of quote. And so it happened that my rabbi died sometime between Friday evening and the Saturday morning after a Shabbat meal with his family and friends. Okay. Mm. 
But it was not until I began to write this book that I came across a final Heschel story. According to um, uh, Edward Kaplan's fine biography, when Sylvia Heschel, his wife, discovered uh, that Sabbath morning that her husband had died, she placed two books indicative of his life beside the table. The Beast, I'm sorry, The Best and the Brightest, David Halberstam's incisive critique of Nixon's war cabinet, and the Keter Shem Tov, a Hasidic classic. She then removed the less edifying material he actually had been reading. <laughs> My cover story on his friend, Episcopal Bishop Moore Jr., <laughs> Christmas issue of Newsweek, was, I like to think, our final conversation. Oh. Wow. So there were all kinds of people that were worth knowing. By the way, Billy Graham changed a lot in this age. He changed. He wasn't so smug. Um, and um, I, I, uh, he really confessed this stuff to me um, in an article, and I talk about it in the book. But uh, he, uh, he was over in, uh, when he went to Eastern Europe. He discovered that the, the Christians there who were suffering under communism were better Christians than he knew down south. Mm. And uh, it took him a long time to realize that. And while he was over there in Poland, um, he was supposed to meet with the Archbishop of Krakow, but the, the, the Archbishop got called away to uh, Rome because they were going to elect a new pope, and, of course, he never came back because they elected him. <laughs> so he is sitting there. Um, I'm, Billy is uh, watching the TV, and out comes uh, Wojtyla, right? Paul VI, John, I mean, John Paul II. And he gets up and says, you know, Christ, Christ is the answer. And Billy says to himself, oh, my God, this guy's an evangelist like me. <laughs> he was right. All the hats that, that that pope wore, all his philosophy and all the rest of it, his geopolitical involvement, he was an evangelist. Billy understood that. Yeah. And uh, they got to be good pals. And when, uh, when John Paul II died... The only organization, other than churches, that were invited to was the Billy Graham Association to wow. his funeral. Wow. So Billy ran, really went through a change, and, um, and, and I think all for the better. Uh, I can't speak for his son, don't want to talk about him, but uh, he was a very <laughs> different man. Well, um, Caroline just mentioned that she interviewed Billy's daughter um, on the radio some I was, years I ago. I was on the Christian radio station in Burlington. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. She's, a, she's a good preacher. I know her. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was at a conference on Billy, and we had a, we had a chance to talk. Um, and, uh, and, and her husband was, uh, was Billy's, uh, supposed to be his, his, um, the guy that would wear his mantle, but, uh, um, right. Oh, I can't think of his name. I can see his face. Well, we were telling a story there, um, when I was talking to Billy one time, I, I asked a very Catholic sort of question. I said, Billy, what's it like to know that you're saved? Because Catholics, um, if they really know their religion, know that there's no, they're not assured of that. It's a hope, all right? And uh, although a lot of them act like they're saved, right? <laughs> right. Um, so um, he said, oh, can I, you know, it, it's so wonderful. It's hard to describe. I said, well, Billy, what happens if you, you know, crawl in the hay with the organist? I had to use this euphemism, you know. <laughs> anyhow and he said well I just wouldn't get a high as high a place in heaven <laughs> like, uh, that sounds like a good deal right? insurance policy and all so I uh, I uh, was talking to Senator Mark Hatfield who's a very very serious member of the Primitive Baptist Church um, and a wonderful man and I told him this story and he said uh, looked at me no smile he said Ken he said if I didn't know I was saved, I, I couldn't get up in the morning. And I said, Mark, if I knew I was saved, I wouldn't get up in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> I told that as a kind of, again, different sensibility. Well, you know... I told that story in front of Billy's daughter and her husband said, I'm going to teach you, young man, some theology. <laughs> said, don't bother, I know what you're going to say. But anyhow... Um, uh, you're entering somebody else's language field and how they understand themselves and their relationship to, in this case, in the relationship to Christ. So, um, well, you know, uh, it's interesting because I, when I um, was, my ex-husband was raised in an evangelical uh, background, and 
in a community that was about was pretty evenly Catholic and Protestant with the, quite a bit of the Protestants being towards the evangelical. And they, they resented the Catholic kids because they got to do whatever they wanted to on Saturday night and then go to confession and be forgiven. Oh, they had really <laughs> um, a weird understanding of confession. You can do what you want. Yeah. But yeah. let's remember an evangelical named Billy, uh, Bill uh, uh, Clinton, okay? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, it, it, it was the same sort of thing. You take counsel and, and, and all that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, and kids' caricatures of other kids' religions are, yeah, uh, yeah. or something. Absolutely. Um, and and other people would say, well, you know, when you get to, you can be saved, and no matter how bad you are, you go get saved and everything gets wiped away. And and I remember thinking as a, as a youngster that, that they only really wanted people who had been bad. That you know, uh, that those were the ones that got all the glory for being saved. Well, I, you know what the truth is. I think an awful lot of these stories that you hear from from um, from evangelists, some of them, who, uh, about their past days and how they got saved, they make themselves out to be a lot worse than they really were. Yeah, I think so. Like my too. mother used to do is the, the story got better the more she told it. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I think that's what what happened. So there's nothing like a sinner who's been exactly, sick. exactly. All the all the speakers that the that they'd bring in were always people who'd been like in the. You're in you're gutter. in Iowa. My father was a, a, <laughs> uh, my brother was from a Protestant family, and he got saved by uh, the very uh, colorful Billy Sunday when he mm-hmm. was uh, 16 years old, and it stuck with him the rest of his life. He married my mother. I talk about this in the book, and. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, Irish Italian family, and promised to raise the kids Catholic, and he did. And he suddenly came to realize that uh, there wasn't all that much difference uh, in terms of what was expected of you morally and all the rest. Um, we've lost a lot of that, uh, and there was a shared sense of sin. Um, you don't hear anybody talking about that much anymore, even among an awful lot of the evangelical preachers. Um, and it's um, taking, seeing, you know, your own moral life in terms of actually committing sins. I think of uh, this Pope Francis. First thing he said about himself in an interview with a bunch of Jesuit editors was, I'm a sinner, and I need the mercy of God. Well, everybody heard the mercy, but nobody heard the sinner. Uh, part and so, uh, while I don't talk about that, this pope in that book. This is a history book, after all. Um, we he certainly does get the people do block out what they don't want to hear from him. Uh, that said, he's all over the place. It's a little hard sometimes to connect the dots. Well, you know, it's interesting because I was just interviewing someone. I'm trying to remember who it was, um, who um, had said when they were when they were talking about sin and their editor wanted to, wanted them to change that and not refer to it as sin because it was like too much of a downer. Oh yeah. We're really, um, well, that's, we seen, he doesn't talk about it either. And I could name a bunch more of people who have these big awful churches of 10,000 people. And, uh, and, um, and it looks like entertainment on a stage. Um, yeah, yeah. it's, uh, Listen, Ken, before we only have a couple minutes, and I want to go back to something you said earlier about the um, 50s being the most religious decade. I think many of us grew up with this idea that, uh, like the early, the founding fathers, the beginning of America, with, that, that everybody was so religious back then. That, that it, you are it was in all an evangelical united. area, aren't you? <laughs> and, um, well, I'm just saying That's that... That's estimate we have. Uh, yeah, but it's not true, is it? Seven percent of Americans in those days. I mean, we're not talking about the, the Puritans that came over. We're talking about when we had something of a country going. So, no, they weren't. Be- Benjamin Franklin was more like it, and he wasn't particularly religious. He was a deist. So, no, we it, country was had a religious root, but it also has Enlightenment roots. And uh, Jefferson writes a Bible, uh, uh, creates a Bible where he clips out all the, the miracles, things like that, <laughs> cursed by stuff like that. I know, and it's funny how we seem to have lost that perspective on history to such a large extent. Well, because that, that was a product of the, uh, the Christian right, 
and, <laughs> and, and the fundamentalists coming. There's some pretty rich uh, chapters in there on, uh, on uh, it, it, I'll just leave you with this, that uh, people didn't know, that the moral majority of Jerry Fowell was not created by Fowell. It was created by two Catholics and a Jew, and they were <laughs> operatives, conservative operatives within the Republican Party. And so they created it, called it the moral majority, and basically rec- and recruited uh, Fowell to run it. And it was mainly to, to def- uh, they saw that uh, Jimmy Carter uh, had uh, gotten all these evangelical votes uh, from, uh, from a lot from fundamentalists who never voted before at all. And so he didn't want to see this this uh, new constituency to go to the Democratic Party. Mm. And so they worked hard to recruit him for the Republicans, and they were largely successful, although I have to say, uh, in this election, uh, a lot of the media, especially in the East, have way overestimated uh, the uh, evangelical involvement. Um, You and Iowa have got, the, the Republican Party there has got a, fairly strong constituency of those in Iowa, but uh, mainly uh, they're pulling the Republican lever because they consider themselves Republican and then they've been and uh, you know been doing it for a long time so. right well i'm glad I'm glad to hear that you think that um, we only have just a just a f- less than a minute left, and um, I just wanted to meant to ask you. You know, whenever we're talking about religion, it can be controversial. You don't seem to hold anything back in this book. You're, you know, you know you're, you're, some of it's probably quite controversial. Are you getting any flack? No, I've been this way for 50 years. So, <laughs> uh, you know, when you're a religion editor and you go to a cocktail party, they say, you do what? <laughs> okay. Also, I go back to Italy a lot. And if you want to, you want a successful dinner party in Italy, you talk about religion, and you talk about sex. <laughs> and politics. Art. <laughs> hey, those are the uh, oh. three things you must ah. talk about, or you haven't had a successful party. So my Italian heritage comes forward when this... Ah. Well, Kenneth, thanks so much for being with us today. It's really been our pleasure, pleasure. To, to have you on Writer's Voices. And where, where can we find your book? Um, this book is available anywhere books are sold. Getting Religion, Faith, Culture, and Politics from the Age of Eisenhower to the Era of Obama. And, Mom, do you have some final words of wisdom I for do. us? I do. Actually, this is a, a, a quote from the Dalai Lama. When you talk, you are only repeating what you already know. But if you listen, you may actually learn something new. Mm. Stay tuned if you're listening on Friday to Planet Earth's Wild with James. And see you next week on Writer's Voices. Mm.